Now, Stephen Dobbins, I've probably known longer than any of these poets, and uh, he's the author of at least 40 books. I stopped counting at about uh, 35. Uh, I believe uh, his latest uh, book, Winter's Journey, is his 13th book of poems, but many uh, novels, uh, short stories, uh, uh, craft books, uh, etc. A couple of his books have been made into movies. Uh, whenever I read Dobbins, I think of Pablo Picasso, uh, the kind of artist who just loves the world so much cares so much about the world, sometimes he's angry with the world, but loves the world so much that he just wants to eat it all, he just wants to devour uh, it all and give it back to us in language. As I heard him say somewhere recently, uh, things aren't quite real to him uh, until they're in language, uh, or, or things that are in language are, are the things that are most real for him. Uh, he has a brand new craft book out that uh, just uh, followed uh, Best Words, Best Order, uh, which is a highly, highly respected uh, poetry uh, craft book. This new one is called uh, Next Word, Better Word. Thank you all for being here. I'm sorry about last month. Technology. Thank you, Tom, for having me, Travis. Thank you, Carl, Kate, for reading with me. It's a pleasure. I already have these glasses. I needed to get them. Have you ever been between? You get to this point. You know, you're changing glasses every now and then. And then you get to that in-between point where you can't really see in one and you can't really see in the other. This is not very interesting to those of you who are below the age of 50. <laughs> but to those over 50, these they become passionate, passionate elements. You think Hamlet's important? You think Macbeth? Not like glasses. <laughs> I was thinking when Kate was talking about uh, what book would you choose for that island, you know? I thought, with Kindle, why bother? <laughs> I could take the entire Library of Congress. No battery. No, I have a little solar panel. <laughs> This is an older poem called How to Like It. These are the first days of fall. The wind at evening smells of roads still to be traveled, while the sound of leaves blowing across the lawns is like an unsettled feeling in the blood, the desire to get in the car and just keep driving. A man and the dog descend their front steps. The dog says, Let's go downtown and get crazy drunk. Let's tip over all the trash cans we can find. This is how dogs deal with the prospect of change. But in his sense of the season, the man is struck by the oppressiveness of his past, how his memories, which were shifting and fluid, have grown more solid, until it seems he can see remembered faces caught up among the dark places in the trees. The dog says, Let's pick up some girls and just rip off their clothes. Let's dig holes everywhere. Above his house, the man notices wisps of cloud crossing the face of the moon. Like in a movie, he says to himself. A movie about a person leaving on a journey. He looks down the street to the hills outside of town and finds the cut where the road heads north. He thinks of driving on that road and the dusty smell of the car heater which hasn't been used since last winter. The dog says, let's go down to the diner and sniff people's legs. <laughs> let's stuff ourselves on burgers. In the man's mind, the road is empty and dark. Pine trees press down to the edge of the shoulder where the eyes of animals fixed in his headlights shine like small cautions against the night. Sometimes a passing truck makes his whole car shake. The dog says, let's go to sleep. Let's lie down by the fire and put our tails over our noses. But the man wants to drive all night, crossing one state line after another, and never stop until the sun creeps into his rearview mirror. Then he'll pull over and rest a while before starting again. And at dusk, he'll crest a hill, and there, filling a valley, will be the lights of a city entirely new to him. But 
dog says, let's just go back inside. Let's not do anything tonight. So they walk back up the sidewalk to the front steps. How is it possible to want so many things and still want nothing? The man wants to sleep and wants to hit his head again and again against the wall. Why is it all so difficult? But the dog says, let's go make a sandwich. Let's make the tallest sandwich anyone's ever seen. And that's what they do. And that's where the man's wife finds him, staring into the refrigerator as if into the place where the answers are kept. The ones telling why you get up in the morning and how it is possible to sleep at night. Answers to what comes next and how to like it. Thank you, thank you. I had a friend that, uh, who died a couple of years ago, a poet, Hayden Carruth. He was a wonderful man, very curmudgeonly, but I guess the poem will show how curmudgeonly he was. Anyway, uh, he started life, he, he saw himself all through life as a kind of anarchist. But uh, besides being an anarchist, he was also a wonderful poet. Poem starts true. This is true. He died in Syracuse. He died in Utica. He lived in Syracuse. Taught for years in Syracuse. Laugh. What he wished was to have his ashes flushed down the ladies' room <coughs> toilet of Syracuse City Hall, which would so clog the pipes that the resulting blast of glutinous broth would douse the place clean, much in the way that Heracles once flushed out the Gian stables. After serious discussion, his wife agreed to do the job. <laughs> Such an action was in keeping with his anarchist beginnings, letting life come full circle, and being his ultimate say-so on the topic of individual liberty. Luckily or not, he then forgot, or wiser minds prevailed, I don't know, and his ashes were packaged up for the obligatory memorial service, probably more than one. So the mayor and his council, all the lackeys, flunkies, toadies, and stoolies, caught up in a shit-spotted cascade down those marble steps and into the astonished street is an event that exists first in my imagination and now in yours. <laughs> but I'd also have you see him in those last days in his hospital bed at Utica's, in Utica's St. Luke's, wearing the ignominious blue and flower-specked nighty the nurses call it Johnny stuck with more tubes than a furnace has pipes and contractions to check every bodily function, including the force of his farts, while his last bit of dignity was just enough to swell that fetid bag hanging like a golden trophy at the foot of his bed. Blind and half paralyzed, a bloody gauze mitten to keep his hand from yanking out his piss pipe, his skin hopscotched with scabs and splotches, his hair and beard like the tossed off webs of a schizophrenic spider. He listened when those of us in the room felt certain he had fallen into his final coma, listened as his wife read a note from a friend who wrote, how could death matter since his prick had shuffled off its mortal coil some years before? And he laughed. He burped out a truncated snort, an enfeebled guffaw from fluid-packed lungs. And those of us with him laughed as well. Friends. To none will it come as a surprise to say we're trudging toward the final dark, or that to each of us in life is given a limited allotment of laughs. Save one, save one, to ring death's doorbell and ease your final passage. This is called Stars. The man took the wrong fork in the road. It was out in the country. They saw no signs. It was getting dark. They began to blame each other. Should they keep going straight or should they turn around? They drove past farms without lights. The man said, if we reach a crossroad, we can just turn right. His wife said, I think you should turn around. The man was driving. They kept going straight. <laughs> There's got to be a road up here someplace, he said. His wife didn't answer. By now, it was pitch black. 
In their lights, the trees pressing close to the road looked like people wanting to speak, but thinking better of it. The farther they got, I'm sorry, the farther they drove, the farther they got from one another, until it seemed they sat in two separate cars. Who's this person next to me? This thought came to them both. They weren't newlyweds, they had children. He's trying to upset me, thought the woman. She thinks she always knows best, thought the man. They were on their way to dinner at a friend's farmhouse in the country. Now they'd be late. It would take longer to go back than to go straight, said the man. The woman knew he hated it when she remained silent, so she said nothing. <laughs> the woods were so thick, one could walk for miles and never get out. The stars looked huge, as if they had come down closer in the dark. The woman wanted to say she could see no familiar constellations, but she said nothing. The man wanted to say, get out of the car, just to make her speak. Where had they come to? They had driven out of one world and into another. They began to recall remarks each had made in the past. Only now did they realize their meanings, hear their half-hidden barbs. They recalled missing objects, a favorite vase, a picture of his mother, how foolish to think they'd only been misplaced. <laughs> they recalled remarks made by friends before the wedding, remarks that now seemed like warnings. <laughs> ice crystals formed between them, a cold so deep that only an ice axe could shatter. Who is this monster I married? They both thought this. Soon they'd think of lawyers and who'd get the kids. Then through the trees they saw a brightly lit house. They had come the long way around. The man parked behind the other cars and opened the door for his wife. She took his arm as they walked to the steps. They heard laughter. Their friends were just sitting down at the table. On the porch, the man told his wife how good she looked while she fixed his tie. Both had a memory of ugliness, like a story told them by somebody they had never liked. As he opened the door, she glanced upward and held him for a second. How beautiful the stars look tonight, she said. I was reading, uh, writing some poems. Instead, you finish a book and then you think, what am I going to write next? And so you, you go into this blind alley and that blind alley, and sometimes you never get out of those blind alleys. Anyway, I wrote a number of poems that were based on very common jokes. Horse walks under the bar, bartender says, why the long face, you know? <laughs> this is called Horse. He stared into the bar mirror over the bottles of whiskey and gin. Yes, he thought, he really did have a long face. <laughs> why had he never seen it before? But looking out of his moony eyes, he rarely thought about how others saw him, since, except in mirrors, he never saw himself. Sure, he was tall, no surprise there. Walking along city streets, streets, he guessed that was why men and women slid to a stop to gawk at him. But maybe it was his face, its very length, tombstone teeth, satchel mouth, long black rubber lips causing people to come to a halt. They gawked, and looking back, he would see they were gawking still. And often they tripped or fell, which is what happens when you don't wash your feet. Of course, none of this was new, yet he never got used to it. It was part and parcel with his sense of isolation, which had begun at birth and was the result of being an only child. He had never known his father. His mother ran off after a few weeks, and he was raised by strangers. He had tried to be strong, get on with the business of living, to focus his thoughts on the road ahead. But then a cruel wisecrack or vicious snicker, would tumble him back to the beginning again. The crushing solitude and self-doubt, did it really matter if he had a long face? But it wasn't just that. It was his whole cluster of body parts. One by one they might have been fine, even the deformed feet. But when all joined into the oneness that was him, it changed. Not only did people stare, they looked offended, as if his very presence upset their pride, their sense of self-worth, as if they were saying, how can it be good fortune for us to walk here, if you walk here as well? As if to see him, smell him, and walk by him, lessen them as human beings. 
Shortly, they begin to brood about their failings, broken marriages, runaway kids, the loss of jobs. Was this his only power to make others feel lesser? How many of the wretched do we see on the street whose insides are marked by scars, who show off their apparent good cheer and lack of concern only to conceal their fears? And even if we saw them, what could we do? The bartender coughed to get his attention, half grinning, half appalled. Why shouldn't he say, stay? He had no one to visit, no place to go. He had only these long afternoons in anonymous bars where the televisions turned low. Give me a Jack Daniels, he said, and put it in a bowl. <laughs> Then another blind alley was taking some little narratives and, and turning them around so that they begin with the end and end with the beginning, right? <coughs> they start with the effect and begin with the cause, more or less. You may ask why somebody in westerly Rhode Island might do such a thing. It was raining that day. The mailman refused to come. This is called exercise. They're also just one sentence, sort of. Luckily, he hadn't broken his neck, had fallen instead into tall grass when he slipped from the saddle after letting go of the reins, an accident, but even so his first time on a horse, a 10-year-old gelding, a chestnut with one white stocking, guaranteed to be slow and responsible along the trails through the pine woods, a stable they saw each day driving into the city where they worked, having sworn the previous evening to change his life, but nothing too radical, only some mild exercise to please his wife, who never quite bullied him, who surely loved him, and who he knew deserved better, a small gesture taking less than half an hour because what was that word she had shouted at him? Sedentary. It's <laughs> a poem called Turd. One of the reasons I didn't like poetry in high school were things like Thanatopsis. And this poem, I think, is probably about as far from Thanatopsis as you can get. <laughs> Turd. The only time I hit a boy in the face surprised us both. He was flailing, I was flailing. We weren't joking around. This was in fifth grade 60 years ago, and I haven't seen him since. Who knows how his life worked out? In those days, days being a writer was on the back burner. And being a jet pilot seemed a better choice, perhaps a private detective. Where I was and where I wanted to be were two islands separated by miles of water. I'd stand on my imagined shore and scratch my head. Lots of time passed like that. So I hit him, poked a knuckle in his eye, and everything stopped. I've forgotten what the fight was about. This happened in the boys' dorm at Clear Lake Camp, rows of bunk beds for 50 kids and all cheered us on. When I hit him in the eye, he yelped. He hit me. He wasn't giving credit where credit was due. It was an accident. He was appalled. I was appalled. The boy began to weep, and I began to weep as well. He was nobody I knew. He went to a different school. Boys from his school kept pounding, my school kept pounding me on the back. Boys from his school led him away. And that was that. But this is just the start of the story. We were there for a fall weekend. And before lunch, the men in charge gathered us together for an announcement. We knew something big was coming. We saw it in their faces, a mixture of moral horror and righteous indignation. This was in 1951, and six of the men were vets. D-Day, Okinawa, they'd seen it all. At first, I thought the reason for the meeting was my fight that morning. I was sure the kid had told and I'd be called out. Instead, we heard that some unknown boy had left an oversized turd in the middle of the shower room. <laughs> a gang shower with 12 showers, 
a, pink, a floor of pink tile and the turd, six inches long, <laughs> plopped right in the middle. I know this because the teachers paraded this through single file. <laughs> the word turd was never used. That's my addition. <laughs> Shit, crap, dump, poop, caca, ass, goblin, black banana, hell's candy, creamy butt nugget, keister cake, long sausage. None of this was said. <laughs> The phrase of choice was that an unknown boy had crept into the shower and moved his bowels as he might move an elephant. He had left a BM on the pink tiles. We were children. What we knew about the war was comic book stuff. So the product of one bad boy's moved bowels, viewed through the filter of adult displeasure, seemed equal to Judas's betrayal and the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The lecture was long and operatic. Nobody owned up. At last, Mr. Sullivan placed a small desk and chair near the monstrosity. As outside the shower, 50 boys formed an anxious line. Each was to enter and sit down as Mr. Sullivan, standing above him, shouted, does that belong to you? <laughs> I won't get mad if you tell me the truth. <laughs> you don't believe that shit, right? Sure, Dan, sure, sure, Mr. Sullivan. Despite my innocence, I was sure my guilt would show. I was sure I'd giggle. I was sure I'd weep. I was sure I'd confess to punch, punching the kid in the eye. But why stop with one turd, the mere tip of 10 years of bad behavior? I'd spill out past sins like a fire hose spills out water. I'd tell him I stole dollar bills from my mom's purse. I'd tell him I searched my dad's coat pockets for coins. I was full of dirty thoughts. I'd begun to masturbate. I'd kill the robin with a BB gun and bury the body in my little brother's sandbox. I'd try it on my mother's bra to see how it looked. I hid Hershey bars in my room. I didn't believe in God, not one bit. I stole comic books from supermarkets. I didn't return books to the library. I once broke a girl's leg on the teeter-totter and ran away and ran away. I'd spent two hours looking up whore in the fucking dictionary, not knowing it started with a W. <laughs> I was a bad boy. I was born a bad boy. I'd die a bad boy. I was marooned on the island of childhood like a sailor from a private ship. My only chance was to plead guilty and beg for mercy. Mr. Sullivan asked his question. I couldn't look at him. I shook my head. Then came a pause as long as January. Next, he shouted. And a million birds began to whistle glory. Nobody confessed. Buses took us back to East Lansing. For all I know, the turd's still there. <laughs> and shouldn't it be? Shouldn't there be a little turd shrine to bully children and dumb ideas, to pre-adolescent confusion, to always being uncertain and mostly being scared, to all those kids who triple lock the bathroom door and then check the window, afraid of doing something right, of doing something wrong, of getting caught, of getting away, afraid of wearing the wrong color socks, afraid their flies are unzipped, Afraid they'll fart in class, a fluky John Philip Sousa sort of fart. Afraid of pee stains, of reeking armpits, of sudden projectile vomiting. That's the sort of shrine they need. And if that antique turd is gone, I'd be glad to sacrifice one of my own. Well, only Dobbins can pull off a poem called uh, Turd. Like that. Only Stephen Dobbins. Thank you all for coming, uh, Travis as usual, and Ginger, uh, and uh, Kodak taking care of our sound now for uh, several years. Uh, my colleagues here, our, our dean is here tonight from Ivan Allen College. Uh, we're part of Ivan Allen College, of course. This is the last reading of this semester here. Uh, we're actually going to New York uh, in November, taking poetry at Tech on the Road to Poets House in New York. Anybody happens to be there February or, or, or uh, November 10th, uh, you're welcome uh, to come. Uh, but we won't be able to pay your, your fare, I'm afraid. Uh, the reading's uh, free. But thank you all for coming. Thank you.